My name is Kathleen Hartnett White. I'm senior fellow and director of the Armstrong Center for Energy and Environment at TPPBF. Um, I think almost every panel that I attended at this year's policy orientation, as well as um, uh, the, the keynotes, it's not, you can't hear me? It sounds like it's on. Do I need tech? Can you hear me now? Okay, I'll just lift my voice. Um, the, the panels I attended, as well as um, almost all the keynotes, actually were on the same topic as this last panel is. So uh, those of you that may have attended some of those, like the one previous to this that discussed at length EPA's Clean Power Plan, um, I hope we, we will not repeat, but we will hone in. Um, I'm just going to make a, a couple comments about this issue and um, then introduce our panelists and we will, we will get right to it. Um, what is the administrative state? There are all kinds of ways you can define it. Is it a future threat? Is it, is it something um, occurring right now and where did it come from? I, I would, and there are many different ways to define what people mean by using that phrase, the administrative state. Is a federal government and, and state government is equally vulnerable to the same thing Agencies be, begin to, or typically, act like lawmakers, arrogating the power of, of, of the congressional elected branches to um, make new laws. Agencies, as, as I think our Constitution understands them, are, are the bodies that are really the servants of the legislature. Their job is to implement and enforce the laws, um, which involves making rules but in, in the case of what I believe is the ever-growing administrative state, it's the agencies which really act as if they're a fourth branch um, of our government, but not in a way that's accountable to the other three constitutional uh, branches. Um, the EPA's Clean Power Plan, and I, I always hate, you know, you tell, tell people how many years experience you have, but then you will know how very old I'm becoming. <laughs> I think I'm still in the 30 years, but I'm getting toward the end of the 30s too. But um, in all that I've seen in my professional lifetime, the, the plan that was discussed as a topic in the last panel, uh, EPA's Clean Power Plan, is, is the most far-reaching, sweeping, and the most stark example of agencies acting um, and dismissing the other constitutional branches. Reagan, Ronald Reagan, I think, was the last US president to really diagnose this problem which began 100 years ago um, um, through um, a lot of, uh, went on in Woodrow Wilson's <clears throat> presidency, then got a big um, boost of growth under Roosevelt during the, um, the, the Great Depression, and, and a lot of people diagnose how he expanded the power of the agencies as a civil engineering um, job. And then there was um, the War on Poverty, LBJ's Great Society program, which gave far more uh, power to the agencies. And then there was Richard Nixon and, and others um, during his um, terms as president, but that under, I don't know, I'll forget the exact number, but I believe something like 28 new agencies um, were created while, uh, Ronald, while uh, Richard Nixon was president. EPA among them, in a very brief executive order from Reagan that didn't mention um, the environment. Um, Reagan tried to take him on and was the first really to try to inject in the, in the executive branch uh, White House headquarters um, means of checking um, agency rules. Were they exceeding the law? Uh, were they appropriate? Did their benefits exceed their costs? But he once said he had two goals really. One was to check um, the growth of administrative agencies and their power over um, our country, but the other was to, of course, end the evil empire, and he really saw them as kind of the two, uh, as similar goals. He said, but the difference was it was relatively, comparatively easy to end the evil empire, but it was very difficult to check uh, the power of the federal agencies. Um, I'm going to make one last point and then we we'll begin, which I think is, is, at the, is, is um, what underlines the gravity of this issue. Some people say, well, we're a complex, massive economy, huge country, we, you know, all the issues are so complex, we need these huge agencies filled with uh, highly credentialed, educated staff. We need the, the, to, their dictates, their technical dictates, their scientific dictates um, to um, be the basis of our rules. Um, 
the uniqueness of our country really unlike any other, and my, my liberty-loving friends in England, I always think of England so close to the United States um, in our legal system and constitutional order, but they say um, no, no one went farther than the United States. The people, we say it so much it sounds trite, but the people created the government in the United States. There was not a, a, an existing government that granted certain rights uh, to the citizenry, but, but the, the Constitution is a pact of the individuals, and that's what is articulated um, in the Constitution. If, if administrative agencies are acting as lawmakers, not adequately checked by the courts, um, or the President, or the Congress, we have um, really changed our form of government. And we make the government sovereign rather than the people sovereign. Um, and I think, I think it, and many have written on this, the, the change has already occurred. And we spoke about EPA's power plan um, at length in the last, but um, the, there's been an unprecedented, just in the last seven years, unprecedented precedented, um, expansion of the regulatory state. One last comment, Obamacare, Dodd-Frank. I think Obamacare is often characterized as a means of nationalizing the, the health sector of the, co the economy and Dodd-Frank as, as, as um, doing something similar with the, the banking financial system of the country. What's the difference between those huge laws and the hundreds and hundreds of regulations which have been written under those new laws and the Clean Power Plan? There's no new law for the Clean Power Plan. Congress acted, whether wisely or unwisely, in health care and finance, but Congress repeatedly took up um, the question of should we regulate greenhouse gases and always re declined ultimately to do so. So the stakes are very high and the, the, the ever-growing administrative state does, is occurring not only on the federal level but also on the state level and a state this big and complex as those say is I think also vulnerable to it. So we're going to focus on that topic particularly through the eyes of Texas and Texans. And I, I want to introduce our speakers and we'll get right to it. We're very, very pleased to have Chairman Darby, Chairman of the Texas um, uh, House Envi Energy Resources Committee, a member of Ways and Means, as well as on the Appropriations Committee. I'm very pleased um, that he represents nine counties in West Texas spanning the Concho Valley and the Permian Basin because my family comes from Presidio County, very near the, um, and I like to say, um, a tough country breeds tough people. But we're, we're very pleased to have you here, sir. We also um, are going to, going to hear from two, uh, uh, two lawyers that in my estimation, are perhaps the, the, the most um, experienced and informed on the issue of administrative agencies in Texas um, and really um, on a national level. Um, one of those is Dudley McCalla, who is right now an attorney um, of counsel to the Jackson Walk Walker Law Firm. He has a long, long career um, consistently through um, areas of administrative law. I have heard several people tell me he wrote the first Texas Administrative Procedures Act. He was an assistant attorney general <clears throat> um, during which he's had experience covering all kinds of Texas agencies. And in 2014, he received um, the Outstanding uh, Achievement Award in Administrative Law. And the, the last speaker is John Hayes, who practices law at Hayes and o Owen. And I'm giving very brief um, um, bio so we can get right down to it. Um, he is a, a super oil and gas lawyer. He's also an adjunct professor of the University of Texas Law School um, on issues of energy and all of that. And I would also add he is one of us, uh, makes a big contribution to the work that I do at TPPF and, and, and many others. So without stealing more of their time, I will, I will first ask um, Dudley if you would Oh, no, it's and you, John. Drew, That's right. John, and then me. Okay. Yeah. You're right, John. Okay. We have a... Uh, we'll get this figured out before we finish. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and appreciate your interest in this topic. I've, I've been charged with giving something of an overview 
And as I want to do uh, at times both with uh, court arguments and when I'm teaching, I like to start with the most basic basics. And in this case, it's what are we talking about? And we're talking about what is often referred to as the administrative state. And all that is is simply government uh, by agencies which exercise uh, the power to make and enforce rules or, more correctly, laws. And it's often described as the fourth branch of government because, as we know, we have three established in the Constitution, the legislative that's supposed to make the laws, the executive that's supposed to administer the laws, and the judicial that's supposed to rule on whether the other folks are following the laws and private individuals. Uh, so it's a fourth in terms of it assumes a combination of all three of the other branch. It assumes the authority to make laws like the EPA with the Clean Power Plan or the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality with environmental regulations or the Railroad Commission or any of the over 250 licensing uh, requirements in the state of Texas. So. I like to point out to people that while we like to rail against the federal government, it's like the old Pogo cartoon. We've met the enemy and he is us. And we have it here in Texas at the state level, uh, city of Austin level. Uh, my associate and her fiance recently opened a, an ice cream shop and it took them over six months to get the permits from the city of Austin just to open a simple ice cream shop. And so it, it is a problem. Uh, the principal attributes of these agencies are that they're independent from these other branches uh, to one degree or another. There's a relatively low level of accountability uh, and they're bureaucratic and that's in the nature of it. They're bureaus in the classic sense. They're composed of government employees who are trying to do their jobs and just like anyone else you have good folks and you have some that are otherwise. So why does all this matter? Uh, we know it costs a lot. But it, I'd suggest that the reason it matters is even more fundamental and more basic, and it was well captured by Alexis de Tocqueville uh, in his work Democracy in America in the 1830s. So over 150 years ago, he wrote that after having thus successfully taken each member of the community in its powerful grasp and fashioned him at will, the supreme power then extends its arm over the whole community. It covers the surface of society with a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform, through which the most original minds and the most energetic characters cannot penetrate to rise above the crowd. The will of man is not shattered, but softened, bent, and guided. Men are seldom forced by it to act, but they are constantly restrained from acting. Such a power does not destroy, but it prevents existence. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, innervates, extinguishes, and stupefies a people till each nation is reduced to nothing better than a flock of timid and industrial animals, industrious animals, of which the government is the shepherd. So I suggest, you know, the problem is more than just costly, more than it gets in the way of our business. It gets to very, the very roots of our being as a people and as individuals. Uh, is it legal? Uh, many of us would say no. Philip Hamburger, uh, professor of law at Columbia, well articulated the case in a book uh, a year or two ago called Is Administrative Law Unlawful? And he answered yes. Uh, it, and he traces it back to royal prerogatives under the king going back hundreds of years. So this isn't really anything new, even though we like to think of it new. In this country, uh, it really had its genesis with the progressive movements and the writings of Woodrow Wilson, his congressional government in 1885, the state in 1890, and constitutional government of the United States in 1908, which formed something of the intellectual underpinnings for the progressive movement and the notion that, gosh, society had gotten so complex uh, with the modern industrial area, we just had to administer it with an administrative state using, in Wilson's case and many others, Germany as a model. You know, a great example to follow. We know where that led Germany by the uh, 1914. Uh, a central tenet of the administrative state is uh, ruled by the experts. And it was felt that everything had become so complex that uh, the experts needed to make the decisions for the rest of us. 
And this assumption about experts has led to this, what I like to call the myth of administrative expertise that then reflects itself in rulings of the courts and otherwise that Dudley McCullough will talk about more. But this assumption about experts assumes that these experts will be impartial, not biased, not ideological, not prone to stay committed to their positions, not subject to influence by others, always knowledgeable and conscientious, and in short, simply not human. But that's the fundamental underpinnings of our administrative state. Uh, indeed, it, it's intriguing now that more and more studies, and I kind of hate the word studies because it's so misused, but uh, some work cited by uh, Yale Law Professor Peter Shuck in his book, Why Government Fails So Often. Uh, there's been some interesting work done with collections of people who are not considered experts uh, versus experts, and it's very frequently found that the non-experts are better at predicting results in the future than the so-called experts. And there are lots of psychological theories about that, including how people get wedded to their positions. Uh, it's one reason some of us happen to like juries, is they tend to get it right more often than not. Uh, if we have any doubts about the use of science by agencies and experts, uh, a fun example to think about is the food pyramid from the uh, Department, Federal Department of Agriculture and how ideas about diet, dietary uh, wisdom have changed over the years. Uh, back in the 30s, in a famous uh, case in administrative law for other reasons, U.S. v. Carolyn Products, the U.S. Supreme Court wrote, there is now an extensive literature indicating wide recognition by scientists and dietitians of the great importance to the public health of butter fat and whole milk as the prime source of vitamins, which are essential growth producing and disease preventing elements in the diet. Okay, so that was the wisdom in the 1930s. By the 1990s, we had the food pyramid uh, saying, no, we need to get rid of all that butter and fat and just eat whole grains primarily, which of course uh, has led to, among other things, an epidemic of diabetes. Uh, and now the food pyramid's kind of being revised and reformed at times. If you're interested in the story of that and how all that came about, there's an ex excellent book by uh, Nina Teicholz called The Big Fat Surprise that came out a couple years ago. But it's no less true with the EPA and junk science than it is in nutrition and everything else. And the fact of the matter is, uh, the so-called experts often get it wrong. Okay, so what can we do about it? Well, the easy answer is, well, we just need to repeal the administrative state and go back to the Constitution. I think that'd be great. I, I think unicorns would be great too, uh, but they just don't exist. Uh, you know, it's, I've heard it suggested that we should have all mass transit uh, be vehicles driven by unicorns because uh, they eat nothing but rainbows and their flatulence smells like strawberries. But, you know, we can imagine that unicorns are great, but they just don't exist. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing is to recognize that it took over 100 years to create. It started with the Progressive Era and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and the Progressives set out to reform the school system, as documented by Lawrence Kremen in a book called The Transformation of the School. And folks have been educated for years now, starting in kindergarten, how we need more complex government because society is more complex and how the experts can make the right decisions for us. And so in, in many ways, and this is the hard answer, it's like some of our culture problems, how do we get rid of the pornification of the culture? Well, we can't just pass a law or a statute. It's gonna take a lot of work by a lot of people. Now, one of the things we can do though, and in the agencies and our officials who like to think of themselves as conservative, can really pay attention to what's going on in the agencies to help control discretion, to pay attention to rules, to recognize that there are different types of rules. Some rules set boundaries and allow for freedom within boundaries, such as a rule that specifies the maximum emissions of uh, carbon particulate matter from a power plant. Other rules, as too often happens in the environmental area and other areas, uh, require anybody who wants to put in a power plant to come in with very detailed specifications and basically leads to micromanagement by the bureaucrats, which of course stifles innovation and stifles all sorts of other things. We can be very conscientious about the importance of the rule of law 
And this starts at the top in these agencies, but it has to be at all levels. What do we mean by the rule of law? Some very basic things, going back to Aristotle and John Locke and many other writers. Uh, the central elements are straightforward. The rules are published, so we know them, or we can even reasonably be known. You know, the Ten Commandments were published, albeit on stone tablets. Uh, the rules are clear and direct, so they can be understood and applied to the relevant facts. Thou shalt not steal. The rules establish boundaries that attempt to, rather than attempting to micromanage activities within the boundaries. Thou shalt not kill. Doesn't tell us everything about human relations, but it says there's some things we're not supposed to do. The rules are consistently applicable to everyone, as in all are equal under the law. And they're not retroactive, since we can't change our behavior retroactively, at least until somebody gets better developed time machines. Uh, why are these principles important? They're important because they're the fundamental elements that underpin a free society and a market economy. And if we're serious about it, we've got to learn to be serious about it from top to bottom. That's the reason the common law was so wise in keeping rules simple. Uh, was that people could follow and they, they could do it. Uh, administrative agencies have this problem from top to bottom. Uh, we call it sometimes discretion and how is discretion to be, abu to be abused, yes, and used wisely. And what, one thing we know is that discretion is going to be there. And again, until we get rid of the whole system, it's got to be there. But one thing we also know is the late Kenneth Culp Davis uh, wrote in a book called Police Discretion is the way it's structured makes all the difference. And just as uh, a well run police department knows how to do that, uh, poorly ones don't. We want cops to have discretion on the beat to know whether to go after somebody that they spot jaywalking at the same time as they spot somebody stealing a purse. We don't want cops to just whack people over the heads because they don't like the tie they're wearing that day. And well-run police departments know that training, management, supervision, and accountability from top to bottom is essential. And in some areas, our military knows that. But unfortunately, most of these agencies don't. And we I all too often hear folks saying, uh, by God, agencies should be run like a business. Or somebody who's running for an elected agency position said, I'm going to run it like a business. Think about that for a minute. The business of business is to make a profit. The business of government is to do justice. And do we really want these agencies to assume that like businesses, bigger is better, expand your turf, and the more revenues you can get, the better? I don't think so. So it does require a different way of looking at it and going back to basics. Uh, with that, I'm going to end with a quote from one of my uh, favorite writers, uh, the economist Friedrich Hayek, uh, who uh, said that the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. And I would suggest that's a fundamental problem with our agencies is that uh, we've had a bit of arrogance. We're slow to appreciate that, wait a minute, there are a lot of things they just shouldn't be doing. There are lots of things they could do differently to be more compatible with the market and to allow freedom. But it starts with understanding, and, and actually I'm going to give you one more quote, uh, interestingly from a significant rival of Hayek uh, in the 1930s, uh, and I, I favor Hayek, but John Maynard Keynes did have a, a good ability for summarizing certain things. And he said, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economists. And I suggest that the way we can help us escape that kind of slavery is to really talk about these things as we're doing here, think about them, and then start looking at what can really be done and through a combination of the executive, the judiciary, and the legislative branches. So, thank you. Always a pleasure to listen to John and to learn from him. 
I enjoy being invited to appear here this morning. Um, John has described, as he said, the overview, and I noticed that uh, the introductory material says I was in the Attorney General's office from 1961 to 1963. Indeed, I was. And uh, in the 50 plus years since then, I've been uh, in the trenches uh, trying to work with uh, administrative agencies, and actually that means defending them when they do the right thing and suing them when they get off the tracks. Um, but today we're concerned primarily, obviously, with uh, agency rulemaking, because that's how, as John notes, and you know, our laws are made when legislative bodies create agencies to regulate some aspect of your lives or economic activities and grant regulatory authority to an agency, often in vague terms. Now, John advocates, as we all do, that statutes be clear and direct. How do we achieve that? Well, your remedy there is the ballot box, and that is the election of individuals who will see to it that agency have, thank you, uh, clear and direct uh, statutes to, to guide them. I uh, and have several quotes from individuals a lot brighter than I am that I think sum up the situation that we have today. Congress passes a broadly worded statute. The agency follows with regulations containing broad language, open-ended phrases, ambiguous standards and the like. Then as years pass, the agency issues circulars or guidance or memorials and memoranda explaining, interpreting, defining, and often expanding the commands in the regulations. One guidance document may lead to another, and then another, and so on. Several words in a regulation may spawn hundreds of pages of text as the agency offers more and more detail regarding what its regulations demand of regulated entities. Uh, law is made without notice and comment, without public participation, and without publications in the Federal or Texas Register. That's the world in which we find ourselves today. So what can you, as a regulated individual or uh, en entity, do about it? It's interesting to me that these legislatures, legislative bodies, that pass these statutes at the same time give those of you regulated by the agencies some tools with which to, in crude terms, defend yourself or to at least resist the agency action. Uh, let me give you one example of the statutory standards uh, that legislative bodies pass as described by uh, Professor Richard Pierce, who currently is the most prolific writer, certainly in the federal administrative law field, and the successor to Kenneth Culp Davis, the original <coughs> guru of administrative law in this country. Many statutory standards are literally meaningless. Uh, agencies, courts, and commentators have filled tens of thousands of pages in attempts to provide content for these standards to no avail. Authoritative precedents can be cited to support any conceivable interpretation of any standard. And that is certainly true in the, uh, particularly the federal court opinions. So what can you do about it? Well, at the outset, in addition to the ballot box where you try to elect people who will cure these problems, you can participate. Uh, John said that the rule of law requires that these regulations be published, and indeed they are. And we've come to this over a long period of time. I started practice a number of years ago and uh, before the Administrative Procedure Act, and agencies were not required to publish their rules. We didn't have a Texas Register until 1976 was the effective date. And now at least they're required to not only publish the proposed regulations, but to give anyone who's interested in them a period of time in which to comment. And if enough people are interested, they are entitled to have a public hearing on the rule. So uh, that is what they now do. However, 
there in an article from the American University, Washington College of Law, entitled, just to give you an idea of the separate or different schools of thought that exist out there, this article is entitled, Agency Avoidance of Rulemaking Procedures. This article analyzes when and why administrative agencies avoid rulemaking procedural requirements, such as the APA's notice and comment process. Well, now, why do agencies do that? Well, because it's trouble to publish those rules. You have to try to think about exactly what it, you want to get across in the, in the published uh, notice that appears in the Texas or Federal Register, but then it gets more difficult after that, too, when you have uh, administrative uh, procedures like we do now have. Not only uh, do they have to publish the rules and take comments, they then must address those comments when they adopt uh, the rule. Um, and these are your opportunities to participate. Now, on the making of comments, uh, that started out, people just say, well, we don't like these rules, and uh, all right, but now it has evolved into a situation where I recommend to you, if you're going to participate in that way, you make your comments direct and supported by facts if possible, and put your best foot forward, because there's a growing body of law that says, if you don't do that, then you have waived your opportunity to comment, and you can't come in later when uh, you file a lawsuit and want to complain about the agency's failure to address your comment. If you, it's similar to the waiver in a lot of litigation. If you're not specific, if you don't preserve your point of error, then you're not going to be heard when you, when you want to raise that issue later on. But when agencies don't want to go through this procedure designed to give you an opportunity to participate, they issue what are now called in some circles interpretive rules or guidances. It's, it's, they tell you what they want the law to be and the way they want to enforce or read the law in a bulletin, in a letter, in all sorts of documents of that nature and not have to go through notice and comment. Well, there are a couple of cases in the Supreme Court of Texas right now that may shed some light on the ability of agencies to do that in the future. But uh, when, as I've mentioned, when the agency adopts a rule, it must uh, publish in the federal realm, it's called a statement of basis and purpose. In, in Texas, they have to adopt a reasoned justification. And that's by statute. And that reasoned justification is to include and set out the factual basis for the rule. Now, that was not always the case either. Years ago, the early cases, uh, the courts were very much inclined and did, in fact, say, we will presume that all facts exist which are necessary for the adoption of this rule. Well, the agencies are not the legislature. Now, statutes passed by the legislature do enjoy that presumption, as well as the presumption of validity. But the legislature, again, perhaps a little bit ambivalent to create these agencies, but then, thankfully, uh, to give you, the regulated people, uh, an opportunity to be heard and to require uh, by statute that the agencies adopt this reason justification. <clears throat> and not only did they now say that the factual basis must be set out in that reason justification, the agency is to comply with that reason justification requirement if that reason justification demonstrates in a relatively clear and logical fashion that the rule is a reasonable means to a legitimate objective. So there is your opportunity to argue in, in that procedural aspect the validity of the particular rule. And uh, those things should not be overlooked because uh, I have had uh, some experience, uh, enjoyable experience, as I say, suing agencies from time to time. And think of two particular cases involving the State Board of Insurance when we had it before we went to a single commissioner uh, situation, when on the last day in office, the board passed two rules that imposed severe penalties on insurance companies for writing particular kinds of policies. Suit was promptly instituted and wound up in the Supreme Court, which said, 
we, we cannot see why these rules, as the state board says, are unfair. As a matter of fact, some of the rules contravened other rules that the agency already had on the books. So that, uh, those two rules were invalidated by the Supreme Court of Texas. In another case, the Workers' Comp Commission passed a rule that endeavored to deny uh, uh, a hearing to care providers before they could be paid. Well, the law, the statute, very clearly said you're entitled to that hearing, and so that rule was invalidated. So uh, the bedrock proposition on inval invalidation of rules, though, is in a recent case to establish a rule's facial invalidity. A challenger must show that the rule contravenes specific statutory language, runs counter to the general objectives of the underlying act, or imposes additional burdens, conditions, or restrictions, restrictions in excess of or inconsistent with the relevant statutory provisions. So that's your bedrock challenge on a substantive basis to show that the agency has overstepped its bounds. Now, one major point that figures into all of this is the um, weight, if any, that the judicial branch of government gives to agency interpretations of statutes and to the interpretation that they announce through rules. That leads us <laughs> to one of Kathleen's favorite cases, the Chevron case. Uh, and I noticed the, one of your sponsors is uh, Chevron, and <laughs> let me say there's no connection uh, between this particular Chevron and the Chevron case. And uh, I, I do have, again, to Professor Pierce, I want to find uh, what he had to say about Chevron. Uh, it has been cited more than any other case coming out of the Supreme Court and been mentioned in hundreds and hundreds of law review articles as the late Charles Koch, another administrative professor said, whatever its uh, drawbacks and disadvantages, it has had the advantage of creating work for an impressive number of scholars. And you can find an impressive number of uh, articles out there if you care to read them. But Professor Pierce's comment is, and I'll leave you with that, Sometimes the Supreme Court gives Chevron powerful effect. Sometimes it ignores Chevron. And sometimes it characterizes the Chevron test in strange and inconsistent ways. So we're still working out through the case law uh, how much, I almost used the word I don't like to use, but I will use it. How much deference, if you will, does the judicial branch of government give to these administrative agency interpretations? I will substitute for deference uh, what I believe to be the proper role of the judicial branch of government is that it gives serious consideration along with a lot of other uh, canons of statutory construction. And e the legislature, uh, this, this topic is not going to go away. One article I have here says Chevron should be uh, repealed or revoked. Well, it's not going to be because it's, it involves the issue of how does the judicial branch treat the actions of these administrative agencies. I've talked about legislative. Don't, I will not get into the adjudicatory uh, aspect of it. But uh, the legislature in what's the government code 311 thereabout says that whether or not a statute is ambiguous on its face, the court should give some attention to the administrative interpretation. Well and good, fair, but deference uh, and an unyielding de or, uh, deference and a refusal to give a hard look at the agency interpretation and rules is not what uh, the judicial branch should be about. So there are your opportunities to participate in this rulemaking process that is so much with us today, and it's not going to decline in the future. Good luck with it. Good morning. We're going to take it up a notch. I know some of you are sleeping, and I'm the last person between you and lunch, so I'm going to try to 
I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, it's good to be with you today. Texas Public Policy Forum has a distinct role in forming uh, state policy with regard to very important issues, and I appreciate the opportunity to appear today along with other panelists in order to try to mold that policy in a way that benefits Texas and the taxpayers of Texas. I want to recognize my colleagues, the Honorable Ed Thompson in the back, the Honorable Rick Miller, and was Dennis Paul here earlier? Two of my colleagues that are partners in this process. I, of course, am representing the uh, legislative branch, uh, one of the three branches of our government. And so, uh, you know, my, my role on the panel is to kind of be the uh, cleanup batter. And so that role, along with uh, uh, the importance of the subject matter, uh, I hesitate to bring a little humor into the discussion, but it, at the risk of, of uh, being trite, I will say it reminds me of the time when uh, the Lord and the devil agreed to a baseball game. And the Lord looked down at the devil and said, well, you know we have all the best players and the coaches up here in heaven. And the devil looked up at the Lord and said, yeah, but we've got all the umpires down here. <laughs> Now, whether federal regulators are really uh, the umpires for hell or not, from hell or not, I'll let you be the judge of that. But I think, I think some of the discussion today would indicate that that's part of the problem. We've got some umpires that are run, have run amok, and we need to bring some sensibility back to the process. And uh, from the legislative standpoint, uh, you know, we need to fulfill that role. We have an important balancing act with the, with the judiciary. We have a balancing act with the executive branch. I think a lot of the frustration that I have seen in this audience and throughout this forum has to do with the overreach of the executive branch and the absence of, of the legislative branch to bring real controls upon the fourth branch, which is what we're talking about today. And so, what do we do? I mean, there, there's no question in my mind that, and I'll refer to what I call Team Texas. Team Texas, we've got a pretty good team together. Through the work of a lot of folks in this room, I think we have a pretty good ball team. We've got a great coach. Governor Abbott is a great coach. We've got a great pitching coach in uh, Attorney General Paxton. I think we've got some great staff. We've got some most valuable players and, and Lieutenant Governor Patrick and Speaker Strauss. And I think, I think they have set the tone that uh, Texas is doing a lot of good things. Uh, the panel before me talked about, and, and thank goodness we have somebody like Dr. Shaw representing the TCEQ. What a, what a knowledgeable, informed uh, member of the administrative branch as we have uh, the ability to call upon Dr. Shaw's expertise and background. Uh, I don't agree with uh, uh, Dr. Reed uh, on many times, but I will tell you that I agree that Texas needs to control its own destiny with regard to the energy mix for this state. And so while our team is pursuing the legal matters, with regard to whether or not this is an overreach, which we all suspect it is, and how we can stop or delay it. I want our, we want to continue that legal process, but as far as the legislative branch goes, I'm going to have to act under the assumption that the legislature has to introduce and formulate a Texas solution. Now, we've been very innovative. When we deregulated, the energy markets back in 1999, we put in place a lot of great measures that has enabled Texas to exceed beyond all expectations about the energy mix that we have in this state and the pricing, the market pricing that we've accomplished. We built $8 billion worth of Cres lines. We've, we put in RPSs that have been exceeded many times over. We put in a wonderful TERP program. 
emissions reduction program that I'm so familiar with and work closely with everybody, uh, Cyrus included, to make sure we continue that very worthwhile program. I'm not going to go into all of the programs that we have, but I think the, it points out that Texas is innovative. We're creative. We, we are at the cutting edge of trying to determine what market innovations and what efficiencies can take place, and I think we need to work through that process. So from the House's standpoint, we created, I haven't created, but the Speaker has created a select committee made up of a lot of uh, appropriation, I mean, a lot of chairs with regard to the House leadership, uh, headed by Myra Crownover. We're going to be looking at the Clean Water Act. We're going to be looking at clean air, clean power the waters of the United States. We're going to be looking at the impact of all of those and coming up with a Texas solution. So I agree with Cyrus. I agree that we need to come up with a plan. While we're, while we're continuing to maintain the judicial aspect of this, we need to make sure that we have a plan so that Texas can remain competitive and we determine what the energy mix for this state is, both today and moving forward. So I urge all of you to help us formulate that plan. There'll be committee meetings. Uh, Chairwoman Crownover is going to be conducting hearings on that, and hopefully we'll have the input from a lot of the folks, decision makers in this room, policy makers in this room, on what is the BEX mix. Now, just as a small, because I'm chairman of House Energy, I got to tell you, there's a lot of things we can do with CO2 other than simply eliminating it. We could use it, Cyrus, for injection for secondary recovery in the oil fields of the state. I've got a use for that. We can generate another 5.7 billion barrels of oil in this state, 8.5 billion throughout the Southwest if we take that CO2 and we eject it and use it for enhanced oil recovery. So I've got a plan for some of that, but we'll have to see where all that goes. But we ha but Texas needs to come up with a plan. What are some other tools? Well, this is a tool of the budget. Now we as legislators have the ability to fund these agencies. They derive their revenue from the appropriations process from the legislature. And we do not need to abrogate our responsibility in that regard. We need to monitor each one of these agencies to make sure that they are sensitive to the taxpayers and the needs of this state. And where they're not, we need to bring them more into focus. You may not know this, but there are interim charges that have been laid out by the Speaker of the Texas House and by the Lieutenant Governor to the committees. I don't know about the Senate committees, but I will tell you that every standing committee has interim charges, and the last interim charge in every one of those has to do with the continuing monitoring and maintenance by that standing committee of the agencies that are called, that are called to be supervised in that in that committee. For example, the Energy Resources Committee is charged with the supervision of the Railroad Commission. So part of my interim charge has to do with monitoring the Railroad Commission to make sure they are responsive to the legislative direction that we have given them. And where they are not, we have the power of the pen, the power of the budget. Now, we. Texas is not immune from uh, creeping administrationalism and encroachment of all the, of the various powers. I know we've had, some, we've had some issues in the budget, for example. Some disagreement, if you will, between the responsibility of the executive branch and the responsibility of the legislative branch. And we're going to be working our, through, our way through that as we move forward into the next biennium. But keep in mind, if you believe in the separation of powers, then each branch of the government is charged with the responsibility to maintain our role in relationship with the other. I happen to believe, going back to the umpires, our judiciary has not fulfilled 
its obligations to monitor these uh, matters in a timely fashion. There's just no question in my mind that the, the litigation that has been undertook with regard to these matters takes way too long and is far too uh, overreaching and uh, does not give us any direction. I had my chief of staff this morning check to make sure there's not been any recent court decision with regard to these matters. I anticipate that your house is going to try to come up with a Texas solution in our select committee. We'll, hopefully we'll have that where we can apply for a, a stay and time for the legislature to weigh in on the energy mix and the future of, of uh, the state of Texas and how we deal with these matters. And so uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, it, it's, it's always wel I always welcome the opportunity to listen and learn uh, from my distinguished colleagues. Uh, Dudley and John uh, have been long and distinguished uh, attorneys in their, relative, in their relative expertise areas, and it's always good to listen to them. It's good to listen to Cyrus and, and, and uh, Dr. Shaw, and so I urge all of you to be active. Uh, I will pull out one uh, part of Dudley's uh, uh, presentation and say that the legislature does put in safeguards. We cannot, we cannot know every aspect, every, and I, and I hesitate to say this because you'll, some people will refer to the Affordable Care Act, you know, we got to pass it to know what it says, but legislation that we pass, it, it we, we try to come up with good sound policy and get the form of consensus that we can get it passed and signed by the governor. We rely upon the agencies to come up with rules and we put in safeguards to have an appeal process and, and a notice and a hearing with regard to the matters that that rule encompasses. It is up to you and the people you represent to participate in that process. I can tell you there are many instances where that process of input has changed the ultimate direction of those regulations. And it is a worthwhile, substantial process, and I urge you to participate in that. So with that, I'm going to sit down and let you ask some questions, and maybe we'll get out to lunch. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. We are open for, for your questions, and we have some mics in the room. Not a one. This might be the fade of the last, oh, they're good. <laughs> fade of the last panel. Sure. So let me speak on behalf of the uh, unicorns. Um, I, the statement was made that a constitutional amendment is uh, basically a unicorn kind of an idea. And I'd be interested in the views of the panel on the concept that three times in American history, without a convention, pressure from the states has forced Congress to propose an amendment. And in fact, that was the way the Bill of Rights happened, that was the way the 17th Amendment happened, and that was the way most recently the presidential term limits happened. And that if you look at the political architecture of states today, 31 of the necessary 34 states to get two-thirds are controlled by Republicans, and the other three uh, are Republican in one chamber and Democrats who don't like federal regulators because of energy and, and, and farm voters in the others. And the question is, wouldn't even the pressure of states urging Congress to propose an amendment like that have some kind of a deterrent effect on regulators? Wouldn't they begin to worry that if they continue to overreach, they might lose their power, and wouldn't that help uh, improve the regulatory environment. Yeah, as much as I would like to think it would, if, if we're talking about an amendment that would simply say administrative agencies pays Philip Hamburger are simply unlawful and administrative law is unlawful, I don't think the agencies at this point in time would be very scared because I don't think they would think that the people are about to overnight abolish the EPA and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Fish and Wildlife Service 
and all these agencies that we complain about and we don't like, uh, I, I think part of the wisdom of politics is having some sense for what's feasible and some's not, but keeping our eye on the ball. And that's why I started by talking about the unlawfulness inherently of much of our administrative law. I think it's a huge problem. And in areas where we can trim it back, that's great. We had a recent Texas Supreme Court case uh, that involved one of our Texas regulations that uh, got way out of line where the Cosmetology Commission wanted to regulate uh, what are called eyebrow threaders. It's an Asian technique for basically plucking eyebrows using threads uh, and regulate them just as they regulate all cosmetologists and uh, require them to take over 700 hours of training and on and on and on. Well, by a six to three decision, the Texas Supreme Court said no. That's wholly unjustified, that's out of line, and that violates some fundamental tenets about the right to work and other rights uh, in the Texas Constitution. Uh, but I note even there, three justices, all Republicans, all who run as conservatives, dissented, and in their dissent, one of their Exhibit A things they cited was the dissent of Justice Holmes in the Lochner versus New York case. And with due respect, as the majority pointed out, uh, Justice Willett, in his opinion, gosh, Justice Holmes is held up as the great progressive liberal icon. And what are we doing? Our court citing Justice Holmes is somehow support. That case, if anyone wants to read it, is the Patel case, P-A-T-E-L. But my point on that is that's an instance where the judiciary did gut up and do something that needed to be done, but the odds that the Cosmetology Commission and any of the over 250 other licensing <laughs> boards in Texas would just suddenly be abolished. Unfortunately, part of the problem is once these things are established, you get too many special interests that have pull everybody too many different ways, and that, that's part of why you know, to the extent I can help with anything, I figure if we can educate folks, maybe over time we can start moving in the right direction. Another question? Or if someone wants to respond to that. Hi, uh, Mr. McCullough, I was wondering if you could uh, list, are there any places besides like the Texas Registry that we could be watching for these proposed regulations to know what's out there and when to be able to make our comments? The question was, is there a source of information to, to know what regulations are in the pipeline and all of that? There is at the federal level, which I'll comment on, but at the Texas state Register. level. Texas well, Register. Mm -hmm. On the federal level, this is another um, think tank like TPPF, the Competitive Enterprise Institute does an annual thing which they call 10,000 Commandments. <laughs> and it's long and detailed, but also I find has very meaningful summaries. Um, I just actually looked at it early this morning. Um, there are now something like 3,640 some rules at the federal level in the pipeline. But it's, but it's, it's, an, it's an accessible source. You can drill down with numbing detail or you can get the highlights. And I, th I think that's actually important because the, you know, the magnitude, thankfully on the state, I don't think we have 3,000 regulations going on at the same time, is so, you know, the magnitude of it makes it almost inherently inaccessible. And it's kind of a, it's, a, it's another invisible hand that's kind of the opposite of the <laughs> invisible hand of the market. Yeah, I might add to that that uh, the Texas Register can be somewhat intimidating, like many of these is in small print. Uh, and thick at times, but also many of the agencies, if you have an agency that you're particularly concerned about, will now put on their website uh, their notices of proposed rulemaking and links to how you can find them that way. So if you have an agency that you're particularly interested in, uh, go poke around the website a little bit and see if maybe it's gonna be there also. One last question perhaps? Uh, thank you very much. A very fine panel. I believe that um, uh, the uh, representative was talking about some type of plan for the state 
looking to the future for uh, allocating different types of, of fuels or energy. And it sounds to me like picking winners. I don't understand what that uh, policy is about or even the need for it. The comment was directed to the fact that we have to recognize the reality that the rule is there now. And how does Texas deal with that? Uh, I, I don't want to be in the business of calling winners and losers any more than I want the federal government to make that decision. So I think we need to, one of the things that we'll hopefully we'll, we'll talk a lot about in the committee process is, and on the floor of the Texas House, will be uh, what is the proper role of the state with regard to this energy mix and, and, and without trying to determine winners and losers, but what makes the best sense, whether it be technology or uh, energy efficient, demand side reductions, uh, whatever, whatever the mix is, I think we need to have a seat at the table and talk about that mix. Uh, and, and, and again, I don't want to be in the process of, of determining winners and losers, nor do I want federal regulators to do that either. Well, I think we're going to have to close uh, last panel of the of the policy orientation. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to end on a very uh, on a, a note of optimism. Um, one, in my experience as a former um, Texas regulator, things work better at the state level, Chairman Darby, as far as rural promulgation and uh, impacted parties access to their representatives as well. It's a very different ball game at the federal level. But I think given um, the magnitude of the uh, growth of the administrate in, over the last seven years, um, I think the Supreme and the Supreme Court's review of the, of the many, many expansive rules um, that have been promulgated in, in this administration, I think there's, there's a, this is a very important time I, to try to push for reform, and there are numerous me mechanisms um, that the U.S. Congress has considered to in, have effective oversight um, on major agency rules. And I think the Supreme Court, if you weren't just going to read one, because I think it's an important, um, it was a, quoted in the, in the previous session that was entirely on the Clean Power Plan, but a very recent Supreme Court, an indication of how they're um, assessing this, and that is when an agency claims to discover in a long extant statute unheralded, unheralded power to regulate a significant portion of the American economy, we, the Supreme Court, typically greet its announcement with a measure of skepticism. Very carefully worded, but that uh, we haven't seen that kind of indication from a majority of the Supreme Court. So I think this is a central issue. This is with a, um, um, a new president um, in, in less than a year that reform of, of the administrative state uh, must be lifted up to the top of policy priorities. Thank you very much for coming.